Good evening. evening. I am not a manuscript preacher, but I am tonight. I've written this out so that I say what I mean to say and hopefully nothing else. Of Adams, Eves, and Apples. It was September 1968, Union College, Saturday night, and faculty home night a time when students weren't invited for an evening of fun, food, games, and getting acquainted. Another white student and I joined two African-American girls for a game of set partners rook. When it was my turn and while trying to determine my next play, I would often mumble, eeny, meeny, miny, mo." To which one of the girls finally softly but intentionally intoned, Catch the nigger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. I can still feel the hot blush of embarrassment. I had, well, never so much as thought. How could I be so insensitive? Upon some serious reflection, I soon found in myself other racially condescending thoughts, feelings, attitudes, cliches that likewise needed rehab. I grew up in a home that taught that God loved all the children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white. Still without being aware, I had absorbed many cultural nuances of unrecognized and unadmitted cultural arrogance. It was time for a serious paradigm shift. Let the apples start falling. Meanwhile, college dorm life continued, and with it, the fraternity-like camaraderie of frequent slapstick macho humor. The mutual banter was considered complimentary, for it marked you as in. Laugh and be laughed at. It was all in fun, or so we thought. You know when teasing was cool? and when it was not so intended. As such, there was one subject, one group of outliers for which insults seemed to be considered acceptable, even deserving, and were never intended as flattering. The remarks were directed towards the queer student, the pansy, along with all other belittling synonyms. The labels gay and same-sex attracted were not yet invented. There seemed to be an unspoken perception that even God was on the side of this potentate clan. The assumption was that God loathed these people, and so should we. We were, after all, what God made us, proper male and female heterosexuals. My initial reaction to gays during my post-baccalaureate years was that of wondering, why would anyone choose such a way of life? Why would they choose to put themselves through this hell of social ostracism? At the same time, I was left uneasy with the frequent condemnatory railings against homosexuals from the Christian sector of America. Something was missing. It was as though we were saying to the world, come as you are, so long as you're not gay. HIV and AIDS were soon to be seen as the divine judgment of God. And gay individuals regarded as someone to avoid being around lest they convert you to this lifestyle. Families, friends, and churches disowned them. Not knowing what to do, I became a silent sidewalk pacifist. Let someone else fight this battle. By this time, I was a newly minted seminary grad pastoring in North Dakota, saving white straight people. (laughs) And nearly 40 years of pastoring and conference administrative work, there's not been a month when the issues of our broken human sexuality wandered into my office. I've seen a continual parade of incense incest, child abuse, adultery, bestiality, infidelity, porno addiction, etc. No family was untouched. It was during a second graduate program. And while serving on a district court-appointed task force 
that every two weeks reviewed the entire court's caseload involving abuse of minors, that the bearing of our brokenness really began to burden me. It seemed that the sins of the past were always ready to enslave the next generation. And to separate out homosexuals from the human dilemma was much too simplistic. We are all apples of God's eyes. We are all fallen creatures lying together on the same stony ground. If we should read it as it is written and not just for its spiritual content, the Song of Solomon is God's uninhibited guidebook at living color, if you please, showing us that our human sexuality is by design hardwired into us. It is something passionately rooted into the core of our individuality. Erotic love is declared as holy as agape love. It is an extraordinary gift designed with love from the very heart of God. In 1974, our own Dr. Charles Wetchaby authored the book, God Invented Sex. And suddenly, we could actually openly talk about those inner drives. Somewhat aghast, but with a breath of welcome fresh air, we discovered that we were actually designed physically and psychologically for sex. Driven by natural hormones that caused us to be erotically aroused, we were also de destined to have an innate desire for sexual intimacy. We were now beginning to understand that our sexual self was an integrated, in inescapable facet of our total human uniqueness. But one question was always uncomfortable. What about the gays and the lesbians within our families, within the church? In spite of my uncomfortable re reluctance, a growing number of gay and lesbian individuals began to seek my pastoral counsel. Their stories were unsettling. I was amazed at the number who described their self-hate, their self-loathing, their suicide attempts, and their trying to bury the pain in drugs and alcohol. They told me how they never chose these inner feelings and had done everything they could to flee from it, but the feelings never went away. I heard from parents and siblings of gays who would tell me that we saw something in this child rather early. We wondered. We saw it in high school and we prayed. We knew it for sure during college. Deep down, we knew. There were stories of dorm deans allowing bullying of effeminate guys as so as to shame or force different behavior. There were stories of fathers who beat their sons to rid them of this penchant, with one saying, I would rather have a hooker for a daughter than a faggot for a son. The sexually abused men and women who told me that they vomited the first time that someone of the opposite sex tried to kiss them. The adult abused child was embarrassed again. Now something else to hide. A short story of homosexuality and human history. In truth, these stories are on every chapter of mortal human history. As we revisit the accounts of time past, we find lurking in the background and sometimes front and center, the record of various forms and practices of same-sex conduct. They appear in every culture, race, religion, class, and epoch. Homosexuality has been with us since the earliest rec records of anthropoid antiquity. We see it depicted in prehistoric cave art. It is recorded on iconic images of ancient Mesopotamian paintings and sculptures. It is seen in historical depictions of early Japanese Buddhist monastic life and samurai traditions. Hindu law includes it as the third sex, and same-sex relationships are frequently found eulogized in Eastern poems and epic literature. Indigenous Americans referred to gays and lesbians as the two-spirit people. Modern Chinese have resurrected the old term duanbai, 
the English equivalent of brokeback to refer to gay men. In the West, Greek and Roman cultures openly cultivated same-sex activities. Armies often kept boy slaves in the camp to keep the warriors settled. Military officers and wealthy men often had their own private pauper boys who received special protection and training in return for their service. Slave boys could be bought. Free boys had to be courted. Homosexual practices were a part of growing up for many young men who were at some point supposed to take time out, find a maiden, and marry so as to seed the next generation. The street saying went something like this, women are for business, boys are for pleasure. It is to be noted that along with homosexuality, adultery, prostitution, abusive women were often another cruel story. No girl, young girl, could ever assume safety. She too was the prize of war. In society where men, uh, in societies where men were not family fathers, women formed sisterhoods. From the Greek island of Lesbos, note the name, the female poet Sappho wrote the famous poem about erotic love between the women of the land. Some of the Greek gods were described as engaged in homosexual activity, and many of our modern terms for sexu- homosexuality, both slang and pop proper, come from this era. As late as the 20th, 20th century, European writer Hilbert of Lavardin wrote of the degree of same-sex relationships in his day, no walk of life escapes it. Western culture began to sink under the weight of its own abyss. Secular voices would soon advocate changes in attitude about human sexuality. <clears throat> the Greek Stoic, Stoics advocated asceticism, that the repression of emotion and pleasure of all types was inherently virtuous. Society's sexual excess and the pain it caused motivated some to seek meaning and purpose in life apart from sexuality. And the pendulum of excess would soon be the pendulum of suppression. The Christian era rode this paradigm shift and pushed it even further. St. Augustine wrote that all sexual experience was lustful and shameful and would lead one to burn in hell for all eternity. Celibacy was considered the ideal, but for the weak-willed, it was better to marry than to burn. Thomas Aquinas condemned all sexual activity as sinful and labeled that which was solely procreative in nature as a necessary evil. By 1563, these dispositions became church dogma and would dominate discussion of human sexuality in Western culture for centuries. Meanwhile, same-sex oriented people were branded for extraordinary maltreatment. In the Netherlands and England, sodomites were burned at the stake and executed in the public square as a warning to all. In Italy, the officers of the night court were sent out to round up, fine, and prison any suspected of same-sex activities. Just 60 years ago, the Third Reich specifically targeted LBG people in the Holocaust. For the last 2,000 years, homosexuality has been treated like a contagious disease. If you quarantine it and kill it, it's gone for good. The Victorian era was a time of great sexual contradiction and controversy. The Victorian ideal of true femininity argued that sexual desire and intense sexual pleasure in women called for medical intervention. Any sexual desire was considered decadent. But before we're too hard on the Victorians, it should be pointed out that prior to the influence of this era, a child's right to innocence was lost. However, with this paradigm shift, it now became commonplace to consider it to be good parenting for parents to punish children for their sexual curiosity. Sexuality became dirty and naughty. Sylvester Graham and John Harvey Kellogg advertised publicly that their new foods would curb the lustful appetites of young males. 
In the minds of some, sexual desire was not compatible with spiritual sanctification. Since we are not going to be male and female in heaven, but made like the angels, we just as well get started now. The term homosexuality was first introduced in a German medical pamphlet in 1869. The condition was mentioned, was listed as a medical disease and a psychiatric illness thereafter by the American Psychiatric Association until 1973. It was at this time that new scientific evidence started to shake our modern understanding of where same-sex attractions originated in the development of human sexual orientations. It is to this science, the, re the science of this research, that we now, now must turn our attention. The roots of the modern gay rights movement of the United States are often cited as beginning with the Stonewall Riots, New York City, June 28, 1969. The Stonewall Inn was part of New York's Greenwich Village, considered a gay neighborhood. In the early morning hours, in, the pre in, the, in response to a succession of priest, police raids, especially targeting same-sex identified people, the latest being the night before, the community erupted in a series of spontaneous violent demonstrations. It was the 1960s, and many marginalized groups within American society were demanding their fair share of the American dream. The gay community would start down the long road of asking their, for their fair share of civil rights. Time would show that they would want more than just legal standing. They would want understanding and acceptance in mainstream society. This is our current number one civil rights question today. Two useful terms have gained acceptance in this discussion debate over the last 20 years. Essentialism and constructionism. By essentialism, we are referring to gay orientation as a personal trait with a biological basis. This view views the hum that human sexual orientations are set at birth. Constructionism refers to human sexual preference derived from the social environment and culture. It is a sexual orientation created via social and familial influences. While these terms might be considered as bookends to this discussion, they are not unrelated to each other, and most sociologists today see a, con a sliding continuum between the two. One cannot dialogue about homosexuality without addressing the biological bylaws of how human hormones are related to human sexual development from conception to adulthood. These androgens, estrogens, and progestins are produced by the renal cortex, the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, and especially in the gonads. Males have, a much, have much higher concentration of the androgens and the specific androgen, testosterone which is associated with male physical development and the male sex drive with its corresponding high energy levels and sometimes aggressive nature. Females have higher concentrations of estrogens, progestins, that direct the female physical development and later regulate menstrual cycles and the required complex process of the female's role in human production. And it gives them a somewhat quieter softer disposition. The true male-female identity differences lie in the dominance of the hormone group of androgens on the male embryo. Simply put, the healthy human embryo carries either female XX chromosomal makeup or the male XY chromosomal orientation. At four to five weeks, the human embryo starts to organize itself into male and female patterns, driven par primarily by the absence, by the presence or absence of large amounts of the androgens. The male XY directs the neural cells to manufacture this hormone, which then directs the fetus to take on male characteristics. The male XY embryo 
will already have primitive tissues that will make them more responsive to the effect of these androgens. We tend to think of women as typically having extended longevities as compared to men. It is even more pronounced when we start counting from contraception, from conception, excuse me. From the very start, there are 15 human embryonic eggs fertilized as male for every 10 as female. By the time of birth, the surviving number is reduced 11 to 10, accounting for the much higher miscarriage rate for male fetus pregnancies. The cause for this phenomenon to date are not all known, but nature seems to take this in account so as to give equal surviving numbers to the race. The male testoids seem to put the male fetus on high developmental octane. They cause the male brain to develop very differently than the XX female. These hormones seem to lighten up between ages six and puberty, wherein the male DNA ratchets up the adolescent androgen levels again, and this can be observed not only in the male physical development, but also in teen, young adult, male risk type behaviors. It is interesting to note that the very early embryonic gonadal tissues are male and female indistinguishable and are located in the same position in the early fetal body. The presence of the XY chromosome directs the production of the androgens, which then stimulate the early, early sexual apparatuses of this fe fetus to differ differentiate from the standard XX. In the XY fetus, the fetal gonads, as well as other corresponding body sexual hardware, now start developing male reproductive designs and migrate to different parts of the developing body, thus becoming male. Ideally, at this point, we are clearly male or female, all alike, but yet very different. It can almost also be said that without the Y chromosome, we would all be female, for we all start the same. In the presence, it is the presence of these male androgens that cause the difference. This is the ideal. However, modern medical science now tells us that it does not always work out this way. The sexual differentiation is much more than just the development of the sex organs. The presence of male androgens masculizes the XY child and the male will be born with a heavier body, and the male brain is much different in design. If everything goes right, we are biologically prepared to look, think, and act male or female. What happens when the hormone levels are altered? There are a number of medical conditions which can modify either in the mother or in the female embryo of the of the androgenic growth hormones. The result can be a masculinization of the female fetus or the effeminizing of the male. There are also some chromosomal variants that cause an, an inherited inability of the male embryo tissues to respond normally to the androgens and cause these males to develop phenotypically as females and are sometimes called testicular females. There are also certain drugs and chemicals, if ingested by the pregnant mother, that can cause a drop in the levels of testoid androgens available to the male fetus, limiting proper in utero growth patterns. The effect in the child can be lifelong. The male may have morph uh, morphologically female physical characteristics, effeminized, but may try to think and behave like a boy man, as this is his culturally assigned role. The masculinized female may start to adapt to her socially assigned role and may eventually adopt lesbian same-sex rel relational preferences. Such individuals are sometimes called butch or tomboy lesbians. Some research shows that a feminine-looking hypothalamus in gay men with whom it can be shown were born with in 
an in utero deficiency of androgen stimulation. Other studies that have compared hand shape and finger length between gay and straight men, lesbian and straight women have showed consider similar correlations pointing to gestational issues. It is very important at this point to caution that we are still only talking about biological or essential effects, not sociological causes. This is also critical medical knowledge necessary for any person, family, or social group dealing with ind individuals with the issues of gender, transgender persons who may be within their collective community. It is very neurologically and biologically possible to be born with a mix of sexual apparatuses and or a crossover of hormonal influences. Such individuals may very well feel like they are a male in a female body or vice versa. It is important for all elements of society to recognize that these are human individuals who are desperately trying to find a way to live in this world. They are children who are born with either underdeveloped sexual parts or show signs of incomplete differentiation between the male and female body parts. Often surgeries are done very early after birth to give a child one or the other female, male, female physical sexual identity. The challenge is to know how the brain is programmed and match body and brain. These children are at risk for gender identity confusion later in life. About one in 100 to one in 200 births carry something other than the XX or the XY chromosomal set. These individuals, regardless of their upcoming upbringing, are often sterile or have very low libidinal levels. XXY combinations are referred to as Klinefelter syndrome. And an XO combination is one uh, with uh, Turner's syndrome. Such individuals often live quietly among us, not wanting anyone to know the real them. It is also important for us to note that homosexuality is clinically unprovable and undiagnosable in early childhood. There is still the overlapping bell curve in regard to rates of physical and behavioral development. Mere same-sex experimentation by young children should not be viewed at, by adults as a predictor of future homosexual activity. Sexual exploration, privately or with peers, is rather common among children. What is more important is how adults handle coming upon knowledge of such. It is vital that parents seek to have a trusting relationship with their children so as to allow the child to feel comfortable asking questions. Actual homosexual self-discovery begins when the adolescent starts to ascertain that she, he is excited by same-sex stimuli, the same way that a heter heterosexual youth discovers arousal to the opposite sex stimuli. Actual sexual identity, where a person moves from mere sexual orientation to acceptance of sexual distinctiveness, takes place at puberty and onward in a person's life. Adolescence is too early in a child's development to be considered definitive in a lifelong orientation, although some six to 10 year olds might already be entering into role confusion. Again, it should be stated, it, ca it cannot be stated too strongly that the effeminate masculine bell curve, excuse me, let me start again. It cannot come out each too straight that in the effeminate masculine bell curve, not all seemingly non-macho young males are going to turn out to be gay or even have an orientation to such. And the same converse can be said for females who might enjoy aggressive sports. In sexual, orient, sexual orientation research, essentialism, or again, biological conditioning, seems to correspond more often to gay males. This is accounted for in the fact that 
irregular low androgen levels are more likely to affect the male embryo, whereas irregular high rate, uh, levels are rarer and would only affect the female fetus. Constructionism, or social conditioning, affects both sexes, although the female psyche seems to be more impressionable. Females also show a later life onset of same-sex orientation than males. Since females with same-sex orientations are more likely to be affected by social events in, in their lives, we see a much higher degree of plasticity in lesbians moving in and out of same-sex identities than in gay men because it is easier to change social issues than it is to change biological issues. Essentialism is legitimately criticized for being too reductionist and determinist. At the same time, absolute constructionism is legitimately criticized for being too, revel uh, too relativistic and does not sufficiently allow that many gays already come into this world with an orientation very different from that of another person who is much more biologically destined to be heterosexual. For many individuals, biological essentialism and social construction, constructionism have a dual intertwined effect on their sex, sexual orientation. It should be noted that we are talking about risk factors, more of a bell curve where the intensity of effects varies by individual. We're not talking always absolutes here. It is well for families and communities and religious bodies to be mindful that no two LBG people in their, that no two LBG people who are, are alike when it comes to their life journey. When a person is born with hormonal and anatomical disparities that might push them toward a same-sex orientation, and then this same person encounters social factors that negatively influence their potential to become opposite sex attracted, these individuals have a double bind biological, psychological persuasion compulsion to choose to adopt same-sex identity. If a person has only one grouping of these factors and other sets of influences are in the opposite direction, this person may, may, may move towards the middle of the identity bell curve. Sexual abuse in, of boys is more common than girls, and at the same time, it is more underreported, underrecognized, and undertreated than in girls. It needs to be stated, stated that most young men who are sexually abused do not become homosexual, do not, do not develop homosexual orientations. Even so, the psychological damage is done. Uh, the psychological damage done is much more likely to show up in other areas of emotional maturity in the male's life. Research shows that male bisexuality, homosexuality, is associated with a greater than seven-fold increased odds of suicide attempt. The suicide rate for sexually abused girls, fortunately, is much lower. Psychological studies show that boys being sexually abused marks one for failing to live up to society's expectations of manhood. It is a confirmation of weakness and powerlessness. In the words of the researcher Nielsen, a male ethic that promotes physical strength, self-reliance, and competitiveness may make it harder for boys to seek help when they are hurt, offended, or frightened. By definition, to be a victim is to not be masculine. Researcher Kempe also states that being ineffectual and fighting back leaves the young man with serious doubts about his self-esteem as he tries to enter the world of manhood. The male child who might otherwise have entered adulthood as heterosexual may not be able to break through the feelings of inadequacy and as an adolescent sexual urges surge. The abused young male may express sexuality as a gay, may gale, as a gay male because that realm, though painful as it might be, 
is a familiar arena. It is less frightening than attempting to be heterosexual. It is interesting to note that in studies of psychological health, the gay male who has come to grips with having same-sex attractions attests this on the same emotional maturity level as do heterosexual men. The person with strong same-sex sex, same sex orientation leanings may indeed find life more comfortable in coming out than in trying to hide in a heterosexual role. While lesbian women do report a higher incidence of childhood sexual abuse experiences than heterosexual females, they seem to be less likely than gay men to report those experiences of having shaped them into lesbian same-sex identity. And I should underscore, we're talking about a bell curve here, just being different than that for men. However, the more the severe the abuse, the risk increases for the female to find greater social sexual comfort in the company of other women. Young women being less driven by sexual hormones and more, are more likely to seek non-threatening emotional and less physical relationships. A female with same-sex orientation leanings, but who endeavors a heterosexual lifestyle only to find herself in an unhealthy or emotionally unsupportive relationship may start to question her identity choice. For this reason, female sex lesbian sexuality is usually a later life outcome than for men. For the above reason, the American Psychological Association cautions counselors to be aware that sexual identity develops across a person's lifetime, especially in women. It is not a decision that a person makes in one day, but a lifetime of dealing with innate orientation issues and at times struggling with the effects of social problems they have encountered. It is also important to note that abuse comes in many forms. Some GLBT individuals might not be able to chart a plausible list of influences. It seems like they, this is just the way they are. With this background, the, next, the question now must be asked, can, gay, can a gay lesbian person successfully come out of the homosexual lifestyle? It is interesting to note that the American Psychological Association also recognizes, and I now quote, psychotherapy support groups and life events can change sexual identity, but not sexual orientation, Un end quote. It seems to confirm, this seems to confirm why reparative therapies that attempted to change clients from homosexuals into heterosexuals fail so conclusively. Orientation is lifelong, identity is more pliable. However, we must keep in mind that no people are alike and the things that they are dealing with are unique to each individual. Researcher Jeffrey Robinson noted that there are those who choose to leave the homosexual identity, but added individuals are successful in overcoming homosexual, at overcoming, excuse me, Individuals who are successful at overcoming homosexual problems are motivated by strong religious values. Shame and guilt have not proven to be effective motivators in encouraging people to change identities. Choosing to leave the homo a homosexual lifestyle is as complex as the issues involved in, ch in one someone's choosing to enter it. It is a very individual thing. It is more than mere sexual identity. It involves, it's involved in very deep-seated interpsychological and emotional traits. Conclusion, we must ask ourselves, can modern medicine, psychology, and the Bible coexist? We must recognize that gay and lesbian, we must first also recognize that gay and lesbians in our congregations hurt deeply. Parents, especially mothers, wonder what they did wrong. Primary moral authority on homosexuality in Western culture has been the Bible. There are three primary scriptural passages that condemn same-sex uh, human practices. It is reasonable to believe that the world malachus, translated effeminate in the KGV, may don't de denote 
homosexual orientation is picked up by the New Living Translation. And I now read from the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that those, those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abuse, the abusive or those who cheat, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Leviticus 18 clearly categorizes men as laying with women as being a capital crime, but it lists many sexual practices in this same condemnation. Jesus does seem to cut, does not seem to cut anyone any slack when he said, but I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We do GBL people a disservice when we single them out, for clearly all humanity is equally broken. Jesus just set a high bar for humanity, he, but he also showed us how to love, how to listen, how to support one another in a non-threatening way. He brought us all to the table. There have been attempts in the Christian community either to ignore what is said in these passages or to diminish them as ancient uh, mere ancient human perceptions or uninspired commentary. But this is problematic. If we lessen the weight in the meaning of one component of sexual prohibitions, what shall we do with the remainder? Do we endorse incest or child prostitution? Some have suggested that some close personal friendships in the Bible were gay in nature. However, the Bible never labels same-sex friendships as being homosexual in nature. I am reminded what one young lesbian who, while wishing to obtain membership in the Adventist church, said, you know, the good book says what the good book says, and no one is helping me by trying to make it say something that it is not when I know better. The study of sexuality in human history has led me to believe that the human sexual practices can be, a, can't, that human, that, excuse me, that homosexual practices can be an acquired lust in the same way that any sexual addiction can become. But how much weight shall we give this to the GB, GLBT people in our society? I am not able to give this lust label to any of the GB, GLBT people who have sought my counsel over the years. I say this because of the anguish I have repeatedly heard in their stories. I have heard horrid stories of self-depreciating self-abhorrence. Many times I've heard the words, Pastor, I would have never chosen this, never. I did not ask for these things that happened to me as a child. It has only brought me pain, not pleasure. How can I escape? I have prayed. I have fallen on my knees. It just doesn't go away. I have had parents tell me they saw it coming in their son and daughter from early adolescence. They saw the struggle in their child, how the children hurt themselves, how they tried to bury the pain in drugs and often give up on God as a result. There's the son of the teenage, the, the teen son of a pastor who eventually sought his parents with, Mom, Dad, why am I attracted to get guys? I still hear them, both men and women, who've told me that because of the enduring effects of severe childhood sex abuse, they vomited the first time some of the opposite sex kissed them. I have seen them pray, fast, promise, try various ministries, try rebaptism only to relapse. For this reason, my hands are over my mouth. I have learned that I must rise above my sins I hate a little, but your sins I hate more. While seeking to change GLBT people, I have found that what changed is me. First, God had to take the stones out of my hands, my voice, the very ones hidden in the back of my mind. Stones called elector elite. The stone, or the stone from the pulpit that might have sounded like God's grace was sufficient for me, but not for you. If God's grace is insufficient for one of us, it's insufficient for all of us. In the end, what I've learned from GLBT people is they, what they want most to know is that I am willing to kneel beside them as an equal, to with joy wash their feet, to dine with them, to walk with them, to be first their friend, to be patient with them, knowing that none of us might fully reflect the glory of God in this lifetime. 
They have taught me that they are not freaks of nature. They are my brothers and sisters who are born in this world with their own propensities, just as I were born, was born with my own set of predispositions. We are all lost in the same way, and we will be saved, saved in the same way. We all need Christ as our identity and love as our orientation. We are all Adam and Eve's. We are all the apples of his eyes. Anybody for a game of Rook?